సో నౌ విల్ డిస్కస్ వన్ మోర్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ కాన్సెప్ట్ చేసుకోవాలి త్రీ ఫేస్ ఫాల్ట్ ఇన్ ద ఆల్టర్నేటర్ సో త్రీ ఫేస్ ఫాల్ట్ మీన్ సింగిల్ వీ కెన్ సెట్ ద షార్ట్ సర్క్యూటింగ్ ఆఫ్ ది త్రీ టర్మినల్ విచ్ ఆర్ ది ఆర్ వైన్ బి సపోజ్ ఆన్ ద స్టేట్ ఆర్ వీ ఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు హోల్డ్ ది ఆర్బిచర్ కాయిల్స్ సరెండి ఇఫ్ దర్ ఇస్ అ షార్ట్ సర్క్యూట్ అక్రాస్ ది త్రీ టర్మినల్స్ ఆర్ వై బి then it is called as a three phase fault in the alternator so whenever we can say that whenever there is a three lines are going to intersect with each other or the case there is a short circuit across these three terminals it is called as a three phase fault in alternator then what are the consequences that are going to happen because of this fault so we are going to then be detailed manner as i already told you for a higher rating machines we are going to keep the field winding on the rotor so this is the field winding on the rotor so we are going to give the dc supply so whenever you give a dc supply the north pole and south pole is going to induce on this electromagnets and i already told you we are going to use the damping winding so we are going to use this damper winding to prevent the hunting and also the negative sequence components also it is going to remove it as i already told you this important points therefore this is called as the field winding and this winding is called as the over this core the over this pole it is called as the damper winding and let me give you some important notations which are very much useful in the analysis of this concept whenever there is a short circuit across the thing because this three terminals are winding i double dash is called as the sub transient current so i double dash is called as the sub transient current i double dash is called as the sub transient current and then i dash is called as the transient current and then i is called as the steady state current so there are three current that you always need to be keep in your mind which is called as the i double dash is called as the sub transient current and i dash is called as the transient current and i is called as the steady state current whereas xl is called as the leakage reactants and x is called as the leakage reactants of the armature reaction it is basically the leakage reactants of the armature reactants or reaction and x double dash is called as a sub transient reactants and x dash is called as a transient reactants and x is called as the steady state reactants and e d dash is called as the ema which is induced in the damper winding and e f dash is called as the ema induced in the field winding so these are the important notations that you always need to keep in mind before doing the analysis of this concept which is called as the i double dash is called as the sub transient current and i dash is called as the transient current and i is called as the steady state current similarly xl is called as the leakage reactants and x is called as the leakage reactants of the armature reaction or simply we can call it is also a armature reaction and x double dash is called as the sub transient reactants and x dash is called as the transient reactants and x is called as the steady state reactants and e d dash is called as the emf induced in the damper winding and e f dash is called as the emf induced in the field winding so these are the very important notations let me repeat it again i double dash is called as the sub transient current i dash is called as the transient current and i is called as the steady state current and x l is called as the leakage reactants and x is called as the leakage reactants of the armature reaction or armature reactants and x double dash is called as the sub transient reactants and x dash is called to transient reactants and x is called to steady state reactants and e d dash is called as the emf induced in the damper winding and e f dash is called as the emf induced in the field winding as i already told you the general expression of the armature current is equal to f minus v by j into x s where f is called as the rms value of the rms value the per phase voltage and v is the rms value of the per phase terminal voltage as whenever there is a short circuit across the terminals simply we can say the terminal voltage is equal to zero so whenever the terminal voltage is equal to zero a current will be very higher so therefore the ia will increase the armature current increases as i already told you whenever the armature current increases the armature flux increases so whenever the armature flux increases the rate of change of armature current will increase in a small amount of time the rise of armature current is very high so therefore we can say d a d i a by dt will be increasing therefore we can say that the emf induced in the damper winding will also increase so whenever there is a rate of change of armature current the whenever we can say there is a sudden increase in whenever we can say there is a sudden increase in the armature current so the flux is also going to get changed in a very fast manner so therefore we can say that 
whenever this flux is going to interact with the armature with the damper vanning so whenever this armature flux uh, sudden change of armature flux whenever it is going to interact with the damper vanning and emf is going to induce this damper vanning because say closed one so therefore e dash is the emf induced and it will increase because whenever the flux increases this e dash will also increase so therefore a certain amount of rise of current of damper winding current will also present in the damper windings so therefore the damping flux will also produce it will also increase so because of this the emf induced so we we can say that e dash is called as the emf in the induced in the field winding so similarly emf induced in the field winding will also increase and the current in the field winding will also increase and the flux because of the field winding will also increase so these are the things that are going to happen because of sudden change or we can say whenever the thermal voltage is equal to zero so we can say whenever the thermal voltage is equal to zero the armature current increases the armature flux increases the rate of change of armature current increases so therefore emf is going to induce the damper winding and the current is going to induce the damper winding and the flux is and the damping winding flux is going to get produced similarly because of this rate of change of armature current the in the same manner the emf is going to induce in the field winding and the current is also going to induce in the field winding similarly the flux in the field winding is also going to get increased so these two effects are going to occur because of this main effect always the damper winding flux and the field winding flux are going to oppose the growth of phi a because these are the effects of the cause the cause is called as the phi a and phi d and phi f are the effects so the always the effect is always going to oppose the cause this is as per the lenz law always the effect is always going to oppose the cause so therefore phi dash and phi f dash are going to oppose the growth of the phi a so this is a very important point that you always need to keep in mind so always the phi dash and phi f dash are always the effect and the cause is the phi a so therefore phi dash and phi f dash are going to oppose the growth of the phi a then if you want to know what is the inductance of the damper winding as i already told you inductance is the general formula of inductance is equal to n phi by i because the n phi by i is called the general expression of the inductance here we are going to talk about the damper winding so ld is called as the inductance of the damper winding and nd is called as the number of turns of the damper winding and phi dash is called as the flux produced by this damper winding per turn and i dash is called as the current just flowing in the damper winding so this is the expression of the this is the expression of the inductance of the damper winding similarly if you want to find what is the inductance of the field winding same same formula which is n n phi by f i the general expression is l is equal to n phi by i here lf indicates the the inductance of the field winding and f indicates the the number of turns of the field winding and phi of dash is called as the flux produced with the flux produced because of the field winding and i of dash is called as the current which is it is a current which is flowing in the field winding so these are the expressions of the damper winding inductance and the field winding inductance so you know the inductance values but you have to know the reactance values so reactance is equal to 2 pi fl so therefore here h dash is equal to 2 pi fl into ld it is a reactance of the damper winding so if you want the reactance of damper winding you have to use that inductance of the damper winding similarly if you want the reactance of the field winding then you have to use the inductance of the field winding because x is equal to omega l omega is equal to 2 pi f so therefore x is equal to 2 pi f in real so if you want the corresponding reactance you have to use the corresponding inductance so this is a very general formula so now always the number of turns of the field winding is always greater than the number of turns of the damper winding this is always the true always we are going to use the number of turns of the field winding is always is always very very higher when compared to number of turns of the damper winding if number of turns of the if the number of turns of the field winding is higher we can see clearly here the inductance is proportional to number of turns and the reactance is proportional to number of the inductance so therefore blindly we can say the reactance is proportional to inductance and inductance is proportional to turns so more is the turns more is the reactance so therefore the field winding has more turns so it has more reactance when compared to damper winding so therefore the reactance of the field winding is always greater than the or we can say the inductance of the the inductance of the the inductance or the reactance and everything is same the inductance of the field winding is always greater than the inductance of the damper winding or the reactance of the field winding is always greater than the reactance of the damper winding so whenever the inductance increases then time constant will decrease because the time constant is equal to l by r 
So whenever the inductance increases, the time constant increases. So you can see clearly the inductance is very higher for the the inductance is very higher for the field winding. So the field winding will have the more time constant when compared to damper winding. So time constant of field winding is very higher when compared to time constant of the damper winding. So this is the thing that you always need to keep in mind. So therefore, more is the number of turns, more is the inductance. More is the inductance, more is the time constant. So this is the so this is what that you always need to keep in your mind. So you can see clearly the number of turns of field winding are higher than the number of turns of damper winding. So therefore, inductance of the field winding is always higher than the inductance of the damper winding. So therefore, we can say the time constant of the field winding is always higher than the, the, the time constant of the damper winding. So now we are going to visualize three different conditions. One is called as a sub-transient, then we are going to see about the transient and then we are going to see about the steady state. So these are the three, three graphs that we are going to visualize and we are going to find what is the net reactance at each and every conditions that we are going to see in this in a very detailed manner. As you can see clearly the first concept that we are going to see it is called as the sub-transient correction. So sub-transient condition. So this is the initial condition that we are going to visualize it is called as the sub-transient condition. Sub-transient condition means we can say clearly this is the overall EMF induced. So this is the overall EMF induced at this short circuit condition. EFE, there be a, this e, this EF is called as the EMF induced, EF is called as the EMF induced per phase and XL is called as the leakage reactants and XL is called as the, the armature reaction reactants and this is called as the X dash and this is the XF dash, field winding reactants and damper winding reactants. So initially in a subtransient reaction, these three are going to connect in parallel and overall is in series with the, this XL. So this is how it is going to connect at this, at this subtransient correction. So therefore we can say this is EF, this is XL, XA, XD dash, XF dash and this is I double dash. So therefore EF is the EMF induced in the subtransient condition at the surface and I double dash I have already told you this is a current which is called as the subtransient current because it is a current flowing in the subtransient condition so it is called as the subtransient current. So if you go, if you want to find what is the overall subtransient reactance, so these three are in parallel and then you have to go for the series addition. So you are going to get in this format which is X double dash is equal to XL plus 1 by 1 by XL plus 1 by XD plus X dash plus 1 by XL dash. So this is the overall reactance we are going to get in this subtransient condition. Then what is the subtransient current I, I double dash is equal to F by X double dash. Where X double dash is the subtransient reactance. It is 5 to 10 times the full load current because it is 5 to 10 times the full load current it is a very very higher value. So during the subtransient correction, during the subtransient condition, whatever the subtransient current you are going to get, it is very 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 high which is nearly 5 to 10 times the full load current. So whatever the current you are going to get, it is of very much of huge amount of magnitude value because it is nearly 5 to 10 times the full load current. We will see what is the nature of at the transient condition. So transient condition means I have already told you the time constant of the field winding is higher when compared to time constant of the damper winding. So therefore damper winding has a lesser amount of time constant. So it is going to lose its effect. So so we are going to lose its effects or we, we can say that we are going to remove its effect from the oral circuit diagram because it has a less amount of time constant. So we are going to remove its effect. So therefore now the overall circuit is going to become like this. If you remove that XT dash, you are going to get this, this circuit which is called as a transient condition. EF and this I dash and this XL, this is XA and this is XL dash. Then if you want to find, this is called a transient condition. If you want to find what is the overall reactance, it is called as a transient reactance. This F dash is equal to XL plus 1 by 1 by XL plus 1 by XL dash. So, so therefore you can say if you want to find what is the transient current, transient current is equal to per phase induced voltage by the transient reactance. It is also, it is basically 5 times the full load current. Whereas the I double dash is very higher, but I dash is very less when compared to I double dash. Because the reactance is now somewhat increased. Because whenever the reactance increase, we can say that the current will decrease. Whereas in the previous case the inductance was, the, the reactance was very less, so current is very higher. But now the reactance was increased so that the current will decrease. Again we can say that again, now the other condition is called as a steady state condition. So initially the dabbing winding loses its effect. Similarly again we are going to remove the field winding also. It is, it is also going to lose its effect. 
So therefore, the field of ionic reactors also we are going to neglect it. The remaining circuit you are going to get it is called as the steady state condition circuit. And the current which is going to flow is called as the, the steady state current. So therefore, this is the EF voltage and this is the steady state current. So therefore, the overall reactors is nothing but X is equal to XL plus XA. So this X is called as the overall reactants is equal to XL plus XA. So therefore, if you want to find what is the steady state current, I is equal to EF by X. So it is called as a steady state is inductive in nature. So it is a demandaging. As you can see clearly, this overall the overall reactance is basically purely inductive. So you can see it is a purely inductive in nature. So current is going to lag here. So therefore, in the generator, I have already told you, whenever the current I is going to lagging means we are going to get a purely demandaging because it is a purely inductive circuit. So steady state current is inductive in nature. So it is basically demagnizing. So therefore, here you are going to get a less amount of current because the reactance is very high end. So you are going to get less amount of current. So simply we can say that x double dash is less than x dash is less than x. So therefore, i double dash is greater than i dash is greater than i. So this is the thing that you always need to keep in your mind. The subtransient current is always higher than the transient current and the transient current is always greater than the steady state current. So because current is inversely proportional to the reactance, so therefore the x double dash is less than x dash is less than x. So subtransient reactance is always less than transient reactance is less than steady state reactance because current is always inversely proportional to reactance. If there is no damper winding, then what is going to happen? Suppose if there is no damper winding, suppose if I am not going to use any damper winding, then the subtransient condition and the transient condition both the circuits are same because in the subtransient condition everything is present in the transient condition we are going to remove the damper winding but whenever we are not going to keep any damper winding then we can say the subtransient condition and the transient condition both will have the same figures so therefore x double dash is equal to x dash and the overall value is lesser than the x so therefore whenever we are not going to keep any damper winding then definitely we can say simply x double dash is equal to x dash is less than x. So now we will discuss one more important concept regarding the alternator or synchronous generator which is called as the governor characteristics of the alternator. The governor characteristics of alternator means we are going to keep this governor before the before the turbine so therefore it is going to control the speed of the turbine. So how the graph it will be so listen carefully whenever so whenever that power demand increases so whenever the power demand increases we can say the frequency will decrease always in a power system whenever the power demand whenever the power demand increases we can say that the frequency will decrease so let me take there are two alternators alternator 1 and alternator 2 let me take this as this graph is belongs to alternator 1 and this is the graph for the alternator 2 so therefore, this is this F01 and F02. So F01 is called as the no load frequency of alternator 1 or we can say first alternator. So F01 is called as the no load frequency of the first alternator. Similarly, FL1. FL1 is called as the full load frequency of the first alternator. So it is a full load frequency of first alternator. Means suppose if you are not going to connect any load, the frequency of the alternator is F01. But if you connect the if you connect a rated load, so full load, so the full load frequency of first alternator is FL1. Similarly, similarly we can say that simply here, similarly W1 is called as the full load rating of the first alternator. We can assume that KV is nothing but kilowatt also we can easily assume. So therefore, W1 is called as the full load rating of first alternator and given in KV is also equal to KW. We can assume KV or KW. And P1 is called as the P1 is called as the load shared by the first alternator. So P1 is called as the load shared by the first alternator. So you can see clearly here F01 is called as the no load frequency of the first alternator, and FL1 is called as the full load frequency of the first alternator, and W1 is called as the full load rating of the first alternator. Whether you can convert into KW or K KVA, you can go for anything. So therefore, this P1 is called as the P1 is called as the load shared by the first alternator. Suppose in the same manner also F02 is called as the no load frequency of the second alternator, and also this FL2 is called as the full load frequency of the second second alternator, and this W2 is called as the full load rating of the second alternator. Sometimes they are going to give in KVA, you can convert into KW. So also, and also we can say that here. 
P2, P2 is called as the, which is the load shared by the second alternator. So these are the two characteristics of the alternator 1 and alternator 2. So therefore now, suppose these two alternators are going to connect in parallel to share a load. So therefore, the load has some rating P. Let me assume the, rate, the rating of the load is P. So therefore, this need to give a power. So let me assume alternator 1 is going to generate a power of P1 and the alternator 2 is going to give a power of P2. So P1 plus P2 should be equal to power demand. And whenever they are going to connect in parallel, they need to have the same frequency. So therefore, at a common frequency, if it, if it drives straight line, it is going to intersect at two points. So this is the point 1 and point 2. So if we extend this one, we are going to get P1 and P2. So P1 and P2 are the power shared by the alternator 1 and alternator 2 at a common frequency of F. So this is the frequency of operation of both these alternators. So this is the important point that we always need to keep in mind. So therefore, simply we can say the F01 is called as a normal frequency of the first alternator and FL and, and this FL1 is called as the full load frequency of the first alternator and W1 is called as the full load rating of the first alternator. See KV is nothing but kilowatt also we can assume like that. And P1 is called as the load shared by the first alternator. Similarly, F02 is called as the no load frequency of the second alternator and this FL2 is called as the full load frequency of the second alternator and this W2 is called as the full load rating of the second alternator. So KVA is nothing but kilowatt also. And P2 is the load shared by the second alternator. So based on these concepts, now we are going to analyze these graphs. So these notations I have already told you. F01 is called as the no load frequency of first alternator and this F02 is called as the no load frequency of second alternator. And FL1 is called as the full load frequency of first alternator. And FL2 is called as the full load frequency of second alternator. And W1 is called as the full load rating of first alternator. See, suppose if they are going to go in KVA, you can assume it as a kilowatt also. Similarly, W2 is called as the full load rating of second alternator. So if they are going to give in KVA, you can assume it as a kilowatt also. And P2 is called as the P1 is called as the load shared by the first alternator and P2 is called as the load shared by the second alternator. Then the drop in frequency from no load to full load. So what is the drop in frequency from full load to from no load to full load of the first generator which is F01 minus FL1. So this is the drop in frequency from no load to full load. The drop in frequency from no load to full load of the first alternator is F01 minus FL1. Then drop in frequency per unit power. So, so what is the drop in frequency per unit power which is F01 minus FL1 by W1. So therefore the drop in frequency per unit power is equal to F01 minus FL1 by W1. Similarly the drop in frequency per load of P1. So what is the drop in frequency for load of P1 which is just you have to do the multiplication by P1. So therefore F01 minus FL1 by W1 into P1 the operating frequency so if you want the operating frequency or come or, or, so if you want to find what is the operating frequency then f, f, then f is equal to f01 minus this previous value so therefore this f is equal to f01 minus this above value you are going to get the operating frequency so therefore we can say the drop in frequency from no load to full load is f01 minus fl1 and the drop in frequency per unit power is equal to f01 minus fl1 by w1 and the drop in frequency for a load of P1 is equal to just do the multiplication by P1 for the above equation we are going to get P1. Then what is the operating frequency which is F01 minus previous equation. So this is called as the equation 1. So you can also get that equation 1 by using this analysis also. So if you take these two triangles, this is a triangle and this triangle. If you take these two triangles, the slope is same. So therefore, here the slope is F01 minus F by P1 is equal to the slope here is F01 minus FL1 by W1. So if we equate these two equations also, we are going to get the value of F, the same equation that we are going to get as the previous one. The operating frequency is same for both alternators. So therefore, if you do the approach of the second alternator, same way you are going to get F is equal to F02 minus F02 minus FL2 by W2 into P2. So this is the equation that we are going to get for the second alternator. Same equation we are going to get and the operating frequency is also same. So you can apply the same principle that I have already told you for the alternator 1. So therefore the frequency you are going to get F02 minus F02 minus FL2 by W2 into P2. So this is the equation that we are going to get for the second alternator. You can get by the same method I have already told you the slopes are also equal. So if you go for the application of slopes for the 
this triangle and if you apply the slope for this equation this triangle you are going to get same which is the slope for this triangle is f not 2 minus f by p2 is equal to f not 2 minus fl2 by w2 so by this also you are going to get the same result so equation 1 and equation 2 are same because they are going to give a same orbiting frequency so if we equate these two equations then we are going to get the third equation which is called as the third equation and i have already told you the total load shared by arbiter is p1 plus p2 is equal to pl because these two arbiters are contained in parallel to share a common to share a load of pl then whatever the power they are going to generate should satisfy the load power also so p1 plus p2 is equal to pl so these are the four equations that we are going to get from here so, so by solving 3 and 4 we are going to get the value of p1 so by solving the 3 and 4 equations we are going to get the value of p1 p2 because we have two equations with two unknowns then we can easily get the value of the p1 and p2 if both alternators have the identical governor characteristics then load sharing is at the proportional to their respect to kva ratings so this is a very important point if both alternators have the identical governor characteristics then the load sharing is directly proportional to their respect to kva ratings so we, this is a very important point that you always have to keep in mind so whenever the both alternators having the identical governor characteristics or uh, simply we can say that if they are having the same identical governor characteristics then definitely we can say that the load sharing is directly proportional to their kva rating which is p1 by p2 is equal to kva rating of the first alternator by the kva rating of the second alternator this is the only possible when both alternators have the same identical governor characteristics so if both alternators have the identical governor characteristics then the load sharing is proportional to their respect to KVA ratings. So if both alternators have the identical governor characteristics, then load sharing is directly proportional to their respect to KVA ratings. So P1 by P2 is equal to KVA rating of the first alternator by KVA rating of the second alternator. So it's a very important point. So whenever the both alternators have the identical governor characteristics, then load sharing is directly proportional to their respect to KVA ratings. So P1 by P2 is equal to KVA rating 1 by KVA rating 2. We want to find how much amount of drop, how much amount of droop or so how much amount of drop is F0 by F0 1 minus F0 1 by F0 1 into 100. So we can say this is called as the this much amount of drop is happened. So therefore the percentage of droop is nothing but simply we can say that here F0 no load, no load volt, volt, no load frequency minus full load frequency by no load frequency to 100. It is called as the percentage of droop. So percentage of droop is no load frequency minus full load frequency by no load frequency into 100 it is called as the percentage of group so up to now we have learned about each and every aspect of this synchronous machine or synchronous alternator or simply we can say synchronous generator in a very well detailed manner so now we will move forward to learn about the synchronous motor as i've already told you synchronous motor means here the main point i've already told you which is called as the so either we need to give as a supply and the rotor we need to give it this a supply and then the rotor is going to rotate with respect to the rotating magnetic field speed which is nr is equal to ns so we can say it is said to be doubly excited machine and it is going to rotate at the speed of synchronous speed these things i have already told you but let me in detail we will study each and every aspect of the synchronous motor and the corresponding analysis also so this is a stator coil so we are going to give three terminals r y b so we are give, we are going to give the three phase as a supply here so because of this we are going to get a rotating magnetic field and for this rotor on this rotor we are going to keep basically field winding and we are going to give a dc supply so whenever we give a dc supply a north pole and south pole is going to get induced and now this rotating field this this, uh, this north and south pole electromagnet is going to present in between the rotating magnetic field so it is going to align itself in the direction of the rotating magnetic field and it is going to bring the speed of synchronous speed or nr is equal to ns is equal to 120 by p but always the starting torque by full load torque is always equal to zero or simply we can say the full load torque by starting torque is always equal to infinity it means that the starting torque is always zero so the starting torque is always zero for the synchronous motor so this is called as the so synchronous motor is always have the starting torque is equal to zero so this is the main problem of the synchronous motor the starting torque of the synchronous motor is always equal to zero. Synchronous motor is said to be doubly excited machine. Since AC supply is given to armature and E supply is given to the field winding, so it is called as a doubly excited machine. Whereas induction motor is a singly excited machine because only the 
stator as the is a supply but not for the rotor so induction motor is said to be a singly axial machine whereas a singular motor is said to be a double axial machine because ac supply is given to the stator and also the dc supply is given to the field winding or simply we can call it as the ac supply is given to the armature coils which are present on the stator and the dc supply is given to the field winding which is present on the rotor so as we are going to give two supplies to this call as the synchronous motor is said to be a double axial machine for synchronous motor when three phase supply is given to the armature the rotating poles are established and when dc supply is given to field winding fixed poles are established so due to rotating poles the rotor continuously subjected to forward and the backward torque thereby net torque is always equal to zero same concept is also applicable for the single phase induction motor as i already told you single phase induction motor is not a self starting machine that is the reason we are going to add an extra winding which is called as the auxiliary winding so we are going to add this auxiliary winding only for the starting purpose so because of that the net torque the net starting torque is not all equal to zero so therefore it is going to produce the starting torque and after reaching certain speed by the help of centrifugal switch we are going to remove that all the divine because we know we don't need that one after the reaching particular speed but if, if you still keep that centrifugal if you still keep that uh, all the divine even after reaching the reaching speed then the overall current is going to drop very higher because of the stator because the overall stator winding the resistance will decrease because both the main winding and the all the divining are getting in parallel so more the current more they are going to get heat and it is going to get burn that is the reason it is always necessary to remove the auxiliary winding after reaching the certain speed by the induction motor all these concepts i already told you in the induction machine itself concept so you can listen there so single single phase induction motor is not a self starting so because of that only we are going to add an extra winding just call as the auxiliary winding only for starting purpose so now the starting torque is not equal to zero because of this Similarly, here also synchronous motor, the start torque is equal to zero because same concept is going to hold held for the synchronous motor also. Because whenever we are going to give a three phase supply to the armature coil which are present on the stator, a point in mind field is going to get produced in the area. When you give the DC supply to the field winding which is present on the rotor, a fixed poles are going to be established, and this rotor is going to experience a forward torque and the backward torque. So net torque is equal to zero. So therefore, we can say. the net starting torque is equal to zero because of this only it is not a self starting motor it is not a self starting motor so you can say synchronous motor is not a self starting motor it's a very important point so therefore we can say that for synchronous motor when three phase motor when there is when three phase supply is given to the armature the rotating poles are established and when dc supply is given to field winding fixed poles are established so because of this due to rotating back the due to rotating poles the rotor continuously is going to subject to forward and backward torque thereby the net torque is equal to net starting torque this is basically net starting torque is equal to zero it is net starting torque it is the net starting torque is equal to zero so for synchronous motor whenever the three phase supply is given to armature then rotating poles are going to be established in the area of flux and when dc supply is given to field winding a fixed poles are going to be established so due to rotating poles the rotor is going to continuously subject to forward and backward torque so that by net starting torque here it has to be starting torque is equal to zero the major disadvantage of synchronous motor is it is not a self starting as i have already told you because the starting torque is, is equal to zero therefore it is not a self starting motor synchronous motor have poor starting characteristics and good running torque characteristics so we can say that the cell the synchronous motor has the poor starting torque characteristics but has good running torque characteristics the synchronous motor basically having the very poor starting characteristics whereas good running characteristics there is basically the torque with respect to speed the characteristics means the graph between the torque and the speed so always synchronous motor has the poor starting characteristics but good running characteristics so this is a very important point that you always need to understand the major disadvantage of synchronous motor is it not a self starting motor and it has a very poor starting characteristics but good running sticks the characteristics means the graph between the torque and the speed i have already told you induction motor is more economical when the radial speed is above the 750 rpm suppose if you want to if you if you suppose if you want to operate at a speed which is higher than 750 rpm then the induction motor is very economical when compared to synchronous motor 
So induction motor is more economical when the rated speed is above 750 rpm. So suppose if you need any application with a speed greater than 750 rpm, then it is to go, go for using the induction motor rather than synchronous motor because induction motor at a speed of greater than 750, it is more economical when compared to synchronous motor. So therefore, if you need any application where the speed is greater than 750, then I recommend you to use the induction motor rather than a synchronous motor because it is more economical. So induction motor is more economical when the rated speed is above the 750 rpm. So for induction motor, when the load increases, the speed of the rotor decreases and the induction motor is operated only at the lagging power factor. So this concept I have already told you in the induction motor concepts only. So for induction motor, whenever the load increases, so whenever the load increases, we can say that the speed of rotor decreases. It's a general concept as the load increases, the speed will decrease. And the induction motor is always operated only at the lagging power factor because the rotor is going to represent by RL circuit. So simply we can say this always the current, the rotor current is always going to lag the EMF induced. So we can say this is to be a lagging power factor, always lagging power factor. Synchronous motor is preferred for high rating and low speed applications, less than 10 RPM. So therefore we can say this, this synchronous motor is preferred for high rating and low speed applications only which is less than 10 RPM. So therefore since the size is small, the cost is also very less but the efficiency is very high. So, this synchronous motor is used only for the low speed applications but not for high speed. For high speed, we go for the induction motor and for low speed, we go for the synchronous motor. So, synchronous motor is going to prefer for the high rating and the low speed applications which is particularly less than 300 rpm and the size of the synchronous motor is also very less and the size, if the size is less means the cost is also less and the efficiency is also high only under the 300 rpm. So, if you go for applications less than 300 rpm, then we have the sizes less, the cost is less and the efficiency is also very high. So, these are the very good aspects of using the synchronous meter motor for the lower speed applications rather than the higher speed applications. For higher speed applications, especially more than 750, we try to prefer the induction motor rather than the synchronous motor. And synchronous motor is used for only low speed applications and the induction motor is used for the higher speed applications. And the induction motor is preferred for the higher rating and the low speed applications less than 10 rpm and the size is also very less, the cost is less and the efficiency is more under this range of speed. In a synchronous motor, the rotor speed is independent on the load. I have already told this important point. In a synchronous motor, the rotor speed is independent of load. The rotor speed is always equal to synchronous speed. Whereas in the induction motor, as the load increases, as the load increases, the rotor speed decreases. That is for the single or that is for the induction motor. But whereas for the induction motor, no matter whatever the load, always the rotor speed is always equal to constant, which is equal to synchronous speed. So this is a very, very basic difference between the synchronous motor and the induction motor. See, for induction motor, as the load increases, the speed will decrease. It's a very basic point. Whereas for synchronous motor, no matter whatever the load, as you increase the load or whether you decrease the load, it is going to rotate with only the constant speed, which is called as a synchronous speed. So therefore, in a synchronous motor, the rotor speed is independent of the load variation. The rotor speed is always equal to synchronous speed. In a synchronous motor, by varying the excitation, it can be operated either at lagging or leading or UPF. So this is a basic, this is a very also important point that I will discuss in the coming uh, coming pages. So you can see clearly here, the synchronous motor can be either by varying the excitation. So by varying the excitation, by varying the excitation on the field, of the field winding, we can operate the synchronous motor at any three conditions, either lagging power factor or either leading power factor or either unity power factor. Whereas for induction motor, it is always operated at the lagging power factor, whereas synchronous motor can be operated at any power factor that you want, either lagging or the leading or UPF. So this is a very basic difference between the induction motor and the synchronous motor. So finally, I am going to conclude the basic difference between the induction motor and the synchronous motor. So single phase induction motor is also not a self-starting motor. So if you want to go for the starting, then we have to keep the auxiliary winding. And also I wanted to you, induction motor is only used for the higher speed applications or high speed applications. And the induction motor, for induction motor, whenever you increase the load, the speed, the rotor speed will decrease. The rotor speed will always decrease. And the induction motor is always going to operate only at the lagging power factor. 
when as for synchronous motor is also it is not a self starting motor because the starting torque is equal to zero and now what we have to do basically here whenever the load increase or the load decrease for synchronous motor independent of the load always the rotor speed is always most than it is equal to synchronous speed and synchronous motor can be operated at any power fault that you want by varying the excitation so that for either lagging or either leading or either upf the applications of this synchronous motor are in mills constant speed is required so in mills you can see in the mill stations or you can say in mill plants their belts are going to be with constant speed irrespective of the load if you go into any rice mills like that for example if you go to rice mills the belts are going to be irrespective of the load the the rotation of the belt speed is always constant then we are going to use there the synchronous motor because in a synchronous motor irrespective of the load the, the speed is always constant is equal to synchronous speed so therefore in mills the constant speed is required there we are going to use this synchronous motor and also in the compressors also we are going to use this synchronous motor and the induced and the draft fan also we are going to use this synchronous motor and the steel mills rolling mills and the synchronous condensers so in all these things we are going to use the synchronous motor i will explain why in synchronous condenser in synchronous condenser we are going to use a synchronous motor at the over excited over excited state i will discuss in detail in the coming pages so therefore these are the ways these are some of the applications in which the synchronous motor the synchronous motor is highly used it is the in mills because we need the constant speed is required so we are going to use there in the compressors and the induced and the draft fan also we are going to use in the steel mills in the rolling mills and the synchronous condensers so in all these applications we are going to prefer to use the synchronous motor so now we will further move into analysis of the synchronous motor especially the cylindrical synchronous motor so whenever the rotor is in a cylindrical shape then we are going to see the analysis of the synchronous motor especially whenever the cylindrical synchronous motor whenever the rotor is cylindrical in shape or circular in shape then only we are going to do this analysis this is a synchronous motor so in the synchronous motor i am going to consider only the per phase diagram so ef is called as the emf induced per phase voltage and this is the ra and this axis and this is the terminal voltage per phase terminal voltage so here we are going to give the terminal per phase input voltage we are going to give here and this is the arbitrary current here it is entering so this is called as a prime mover acting as load in the synchronous motor it is going to act like a load because the prime mover or we can say the shaft is going to act like a load v is called as supply voltage or simply we can also call as a terminal voltage and ef and ef is called as a back em for the induced emf you can use any of the terms that you want to use v is called as supply voltage or terminal voltage and ef is called as the back em for the induced emf then if you apply the basic kvl then we, we are going to get v is equal to ef plus ia into ra plus j into xs so ra plus j into xs is called as the zs so therefore v is equal to ef plus ia into zs so this is the voltage equation that we are going to get for this synchronous motor so now we are going to draw the phasor diagram for the motor and also the alternator as i have already told you here for the alternator for alternator i have already told you which is ef is equal to v plus ia into zs so if i take the reference as v if i take the reference as v irrespective of the load irrespective of the load whether you take the irrespective of the load whether it's a lagging load or leading load definitely we can say that the ef is always going to lead the voltage v it is the alternator it is in the alternator but in the motor it is a reverse case ef is always going to lag the v so this is a concept that you always have to remember see in the alternator if you take the if you take the terminal load as reference because ef is equal to v plus j, j into i into xs so therefore irrespective of the current whether it is a lagging or whether it is a leading here whether it is a lagging or whether it is a leading in nature always ef is is always leading the v so ef is always going to lead the v it is called as in the alternator whereas in the motor v is equal to ef plus i a into zs so if you take ef as a re reference and the irrespective of the current ia to the irrespective of the nature of the current ia always you are going to get v as a leading so this is a point which is always need to remember so in alternator always ef is always going to lead the way whereas in the motor it's a reverse case which is the ef is always going to lag the v so this is a very important thing that you always need to keep in your mind 
then you will see for the lagging nature so for the lagging nature you will see what is the case it is going to happen so therefore here if is equal to less or we can say under excitation if the field current is very less so in the rotor we are going to give a less amount of field current so therefore it is called as the under excitation as i already told you under excitation means ef cos delta is less than v or simply we can also call it as the ef is always less than v so whenever ef is less than v it is called as the, the magnitude part the magnitude of ef is less than v it is said to be under excitation this is possible only when the field current is less or, or it is also called as the under excitation and then we will see what is the phasor diagram that we are going to get here so here i am going to take ef as a reference so ef as the reference if this is the ef as a reference then definitely i have already told you v is always going to lead the ef reference so then v is equal to ef plus ia into zs so therefore this is i this is the current ia the current ia is going to lag the ef so it is called as a lagging nature lagging nature means here we are going to as associate the lagging nature with respect to the induced emf voltage so ef and the current ia the current ia is going to lag the ef so it is called as a lagging pore factor so lagging nature so therefore the ia is going to lag the ef so it is called as a lagging nature so therefore let me assume the angle is something but this psi psi is the angle between the ef and the ia as i already told you in the synchronous alternate or we can see in the alternate concept or only i have already told you the angle between the ef and ia is called as the internal pore factor angle which is represented by a symbol psi this concept i have already told you which is psi here psi or phi you can go for psi let me assume it is a psi symbol then this is the ia into ra and this is ia into jxs then if you do the addition of all these vectors we are going to get this called as term so supply voltage or terminal voltage which is v so this is the vector that you are going to get here and and, and i already told you the angle between the ef and v is called as the load angle which is delta so you can say clearly delta and the angle between v and ia v and ia is called as the theta this is i already told you this called as the theta always the angle between the v and ia is called as the theta and the angle between ef and v is called as the delta and the angle between the ef and ia is called as the internal pore factor angle which is called as the psi these things i have already told you so from this diagram you can say clearly theta is equal to delta plus psi so this equation you can say clearly from this vector diagram theta is equal to delta plus psi then if you go for the if you go for the pythagoras theorem see if you go for pythagoras theorem this is this length is ef then what is this length this length is called as the ef into cos phi see now i want to use the pythagoras theorem of this triangle so this is the triangle which i want to choose here then what is this length this length is called as how much is this length this length is this total length is v cos theta this total length is v cos theta so v cos theta minus ia into ra is called as this length so this is the length is called as the v cos theta minus ia into ra and this length what is this length which is v sin theta minus ia into xs this length is nothing but which is v sin theta minus ia into xs then you know this length you also know this length then this term is ef the pythagoras theorem so therefore ef square is equal to this is v cos theta minus ia into ra whole square plus v sin theta minus ia into xs whole square so therefore ef is equal to under root over v cos theta minus ia into ra whole square plus v sin theta minus ia into xs whole square so this is the emf that you are going to get this call as the ef is equal to under root over v cos theta minus ia into r v cos theta minus ia into r whole square plus v sin theta minus ia into xs whole square so this is the equation that you are going to get for this lagging nature load so this is the equation that you always need to keep in your mind for leading nature suppose for leading nature means i have already told you what is the leading nature concept leading nature means the current ia is going to lead the if the current ia is going to lead the if so this is the concept that you always need to keep in your mind if this leading nature is possible only if we increase the field current so if you increase the field current to a very 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 high value then we can say that it is called as the over excitation so whenever the field current is less means under excitation if the field current is very high it is called as the over excitation then simply we can say that at this condition ef the magnitude of ef value is always greater than the magnitude of the terminal voltage or supply voltage which is then whenever the if is very very more whenever the field current is very very high then the magnitude of the induced voltage is lesser than the supply voltage or terminal voltage so therefore ef is always greater than mod v this is the case that you are going to get here 
and that, and now we will see what is that things are going to happen. As I've already told you, I am going to take EF as a reference. Then the current IA is going to lead here. As I've already told you, leading means it is a angle between the IA and the EF. The leading nature means IA is going to lead the EF. IA is going to lead the EF. So it is called as the leading nature. And this is called as the IA into RA and this is IA into JXS. If I add these three vectors, we are going to get called as the V. So you can see clearly from this diagram, the EF value is always higher than V. So therefore the magnitude of EF is always greater than the magnitude of V. So therefore we can say it is said to be a leading nature. Now you can see clearly as I have already, already told you, the angle between EF and V is called as the delta. And the angle between the EF and IA is called as the internal power vector angle which is psi. And the angle between the V and IA is called as the theta. Is, these things I have already told you in the previous concepts only. So therefore, if you see clearly, the phi is equal to the psi is equal to theta plus delta. As you can see clearly from here, so psi is equal to theta plus delta. So delta is the phase angle between the EF and V, and theta is the phase angle between the V and IA, and psi is the phase angle between the EF and IA. So leading nature means the current IA is leading the, the current IA is leading the EF, and the lagging nature means the current IA is lagging the EF, in case of the synchronous motor. Whereas in case of synchronous generator, the lagging nature means the current IA is lagging the terminal voltage and the leading nature means the current IA is leading the terminal voltage. This is a very important word that you always need to keep in mind. For synchronous generator, the leading means the current IA is leading the terminal voltage V and the lagging means the current IA is, is lagging the terminal voltage V. Whereas in synchronous motor, the lagging nature means the current IA is lagging the EF. Whereas the leading nature means the current IA is leading the EF voltage, the induced voltage, which is EF. So this is the concept that you always need to keep in mind. So now, if I want to find what is the value of the EF, so if I want to find what is the value of EF for this equation, for this for this vector diagram, we are going to get this EF is equal to under root over V cos the minus IA into RA whole square plus V sin theta plus IA into XS whole square. So now we are going to get EF is equal to under root over V cos the minus IA into RA whole square plus V sin theta plus IA into XS whole square. So this is the equation we are going to get for this leading nature. So finally, I am going to give you the important relations which are useful for the both the synchronous machines and the synchronous motor. So therefore, only for the synchronous generator. So for the cylindrical pole, for the cylindrical pole synchronous generator, then what is the EF, the EF value? EF is equal to under root over V cos it plus IA into R A whole square plus V sin it plus R minus IA into X S whole square. These things I have already told you in the cylindrical pole synchronous generator. Positive means for the lagging nature and minus means leading nature. Lagging means I have already told you the lagging means we can say that simply the current IA is lagging the V and leading means the current IA is leading the V. Whereas for cylindrical pole synchronous motor, EF is equal to under root over V cos theta minus IA into R A whole square plus V sin theta minus plus IA excess whole square. Plus means for the leading load and minus means for the lagging. Leading means the current IA is leading the EF and the lagging means current IA is lagging the EF. So this is the point that you always need to keep in mind. So see, see the basic difference between them is re plus plus by minus and here replace interchange plus by minus and minus by plus. Here also what you have to do, just interchange the plus by minus you are going to get for lagging and minus by plus you are going to get for leading. So only thing that you need to do is here replace plus by minus and here plus by minus and minus by plus. Here also you have to replace plus by minus and minus by plus. So therefore now if you keep your minus you are going to get for lagging and if you keep your plus you are going to get for leading. So the only difference, basic difference is here. So replace here plus by minus and here plus by minus and minus by plus. So therefore here also you have to replace here same thing which is called as the plus by minus and minus by plus. So here plus by minus means minus is nothing but lagging and minus by plus means it is leading. So here you don't have to change this minus plus. I know it is going to give you same thing. But still if you change also nothing will happen because you know the convention. So finally replace by plus by minus here. So finally I can conclude that just replace this one plus by minus and here a plus plus by minus at minus by plus. So you are going to get like this. So this is the equation that you are going to get. So this is for the synchronous or we can say that this is the equation for the cylindrical pole synchronous generator 
and this is the equation for the cylindrical pore circuitous motor. So finally I can say that this 3 plus plus by minus here, just keep all this plus by plus minus by plus, we don't have to change anything here. And again, they just keep plus plus by minus and minus by plus. So we are going to get the minus per lagging and plus per leading. So therefore, here for this for, for cylindrical pore cylindrical motor, basically this lagging and leading concept is related to theta. So theta is the angle between the I and V. If I A hits V, it is called as the leading. If I A lags V, it is called as the lagging. Whereas for this, this is the equation for the cylindrical pole synchronous motor and the lagging and leading is related to the concept of phi. The psi is the angle between the EF and IA. If IA leads EF, it is called the leading and when IA lags EF, it is called as the lagging. So this is the concept that you always need to understand. So whenever the IF is less, it is called as the under excitation. If the IF is more, it is called as the over excitation. So now we will discuss about another new concept which is called as the silent pole synchronous motor. So up to now we have learned about the cylindrical one. But now we will especially le learn about the silent pole synchronous motor. So here the synchronous impedance will have three parts. One is called as the RA and XT and XQ. So whereas in the previous case we have only RA and XS. XS means XA plus XL. But here we are going to have three components RA, XD and XQ. So RA is called as the armature resistance, XT is called as the, the reactance in the terms of the direct axis and the reactance in terms of the quadrature axis. So XD means the axis in the, in the direction of the direct axis and XQ means it is the reactance in the terms of the quadrature axis. The drop with respect to RA is called as the IA into RA and the drop with respect to XD is called as the ID into XD and the drop with respect to XQ is called as the IQ into XQ. So therefore, ID is a curve with respect to delta axis and IQ is a curve with respect to quadrature axis. So these are the three things that you always need to keep in mind and then we will see what is the for lagging power factor. So for lagging power factor means the field current is very very less. So whenever the field current is very less, I have already told you the value, the amount of the EMF is less than the amount of terminal voltage. So now I am going to draw the phasor diagram with respect to this lagging power factor. So I am going to take the reference voltage as the EF. The current IA is going to lag here. <coughs> so this is the current IA. So this is called as the, so this is the current IA. And this is the value of the EF. The angle between the EF and IA is called as the psi. So you can see clearly here it is a psi. And then we are going to see EF, EF plus. Then I want to the drop which is called as the IA into RA. So this is called as the IA into RA. Then IQ into XQ. So let me assume these are the three points A, B and D. So let me assume these are the three points which are called as the A, B and D. Then what is the value of AD? So AD is equal to, which is AD is equal to IQ is equal to IA into cos psi. So therefore we can say that which is called as the, this is nothing but which is this a, AD is equal to which is IA into cos phi, IA into sin phi. So this AB, so this is the point AB, this is A and this is B. So AB is equal to IA into cos psi. And this AD is nothing but IA into sin phi, sin psi. So therefore, this AB is equal to IA into cos psi or cos psi. And this is called as the AD is equal to IA into sin psi. So this AB is called as the quadrature current and this AD is called as the delta axis current. So this AB is called as the quadrature axis current and this AD is called as the delta axis current. So therefore, AB is equal to IQ is equal to IA into cos psi and this AD is equal to ID is equal to IA into sin psi. Then, I have already told you EF plus which is J into ID into XD. So this is called as the, this is called as the IQ go for 90 degree phase shift. So this is called as the J into IA into XQ. Similarly, this is called as ID. So 90 degree phase shift leading means it is going to have in this direction. It is J into ID into XD. So we can say that this is EF and this is called as the J IQ into XQ because this is this is if this is a IQ, then this will be nothing but simply we can say this is called as the IQ into XQ. If this is ID, then just a 90 degree positive phase shift means in this direction. So this is plus J ID into XD. And this is IA into RA. So if you add all these three vectors, we are going to get the, the resultant voltage is called as a B. So we can see clearly from this phase diagram, 
the value of P is always greater than the value of EF, the value of the value. Because I already told you that the lagging power factor remains, I want. Lagging power factor remains whenever the field current is very, very less. So therefore, the EF value is always less than the terminal voltage. So EF is always less than supply voltage like that. So therefore, we can say clearly here. So I already told you the lagging power factor. So whenever the field current is less, it is called as the under excitation. So the amount of EF value is always less than the amount of terminal voltage. So it is called as then the signal motor is going to operate in the lagging power factor. Lagging power factor means the current is going to lag the EF voltage. So now we will draw for the leading power factor. Leading power factor means the current IA is going to lead the, the current IA is going to lead the EF. So whenever the current IA is going to lead the EF means the we can say that the field current is very higher. The field current is very higher means we can say the EF value is always greater than the terminal voltage. So EF is always greater than supply voltage like that. So therefore you can see clearly here, if this is the EF, then I already told you, if this is the IA, the power factor triangle is nothing but, I have missed some important point which is here, you can see clearly, the delta is the angle between the EF and V, and delta is the angle between the V and IA, and psi is the angle between the EF and IA. So you can see clearly from this diagram, then theta is equal to psi plus delta. So you can see clearly, theta is equal to psi plus delta. So theta is the angle between the V and IA, psi is the angle between the EF and IA, and delta is the angle between the EF and V. So this is for the lagging power factor range. So for leading power factor, EF is always greater than V. So therefore it is going to operate in the over excited mode. So therefore we can say simply, if you are going to draw the phasor diagram, leading means the current IA is going to lead the EF. Then the angle between the EF and IA is called as the psi. You can see clearly here it is a psi. So field flux is always going to lead the so field flux, the field flux is always going to lead the EMF induced per phase voltage by 90 degree. This concept I have already told you in the synchronous machine itself. So our field flux is always going to lead the EMF induced by 90 degree. If you do the exponent of this one, so if you do the component of it in this direction, it is called as the quadrature axis. So this is called as the quadrature axis which is IQ is equal to IA into cos phi. So this, is, this component is called as the IQ. So this component is called as the IQ which is equal to IA into cos phi. Whereas the direct axis means this current which is IA into sin phi. So therefore IA into cos phi is called as the, this is called as the quadrature axis and this is called as the direct axis. You can see clearly from this one. So therefore IQ is equal to IA into cos phi and ID is equal to IA into sin phi. So now then we have to do the vector addition of all the vectors which is Okay, if this is IQ, then you have to do the 90 degree phase shift. So then we are going to get J into IQ into XQ. We are going to get like this. And this is called as the IQ. This is called as the ID. Then you have to do a 90 degree positive phase shift means in this direction. So therefore, the, this is called as the ID into XD. And then we have to add the IA into RA in the same direction of IA. So this is IA into RA. So if you add all these three vectors, we are going to get V. So you can say clearly the value of the value of V is always lesser than the, the value of EF in this case. So in this leading power factor you can get the value of V is lesser than the, the value of EF. So the value of V we are going to get lesser than the EF. So quadrature current is equal to, this is called as a quadrature current is equal to IA into cos phi and ID is equal to IA into sin phi. So finally we are going to compare, so finally we are going to compare each and everything for the silent pole synchronous generator and the silent pole synchronous motor. So we have learned for this concept of silent pole synchronous motor, we have learned up to now. So let me tell you in detail regarding these equations. The value of EF, so EF value we are going to get like this. The EF is nothing but which is equal to, suppose let me assume for lagging nature. So for lagging nature what you are going to get here, V cos delta. EF is equal to V cos delta minus IQ into RA plus ID into XD. So this is the current that we are going to get EMF equation which is EF is equal to V cos delta minus IQ into RA minus plus ID into XD. And tan psi is equal to V sin delta minus plus IQ into XQ by V cos delta minus IA into RA. So these equations that we are going to get from the analysis of the lagging power factor and the leading power factor. So these are the equations that we are going to get and plus is used for the leading and minus is used for the lagging. So this concept we have known up to now. So generally we are going to write the same equations for the silent pole synchronous generator also. So EF is equal to V cos delta plus 3 plus minus by plus which is IQ into RA. 
So just to the interchange of this one. So minus 2 plus 1 plus 2 minus which is id into sb and tan phi is equal to v sin beta. So here also do the uh, here also do the replacement plus 2 minus iq into x cube by v cos theta. But here v plus minus by plus we are going to get plus into ia into ra. So plus is used for lagging and minus is used for the reading. So now if you compare one important point, so these both equals are same. Just thing is here v plus plus by minus here and here plus by minus. Remaining everything is same. So here v plus plus by minus and here also v plus plus by minus. And here the above case is a plus for the lagging but now plus for the leading. So minus means for lag leading means it is again plus for leading. So therefore just v plus here plus by minus and minus by plus you are going to get these things. So therefore, simply just a plus plus by minus plus by minus. So plus by minus means we are going to get for lagging and minus by plus means we are going to get for leading. So therefore, just you have to replace this plus by minus, this plus by minus and this plus by minus at minus by plus. So you are going to get these equations. So this is the only thing that you are that you need to remember. If you remember the, this equation, just a plus plus by minus plus by minus and then here plus by minus and minus by plus. So you are going to get the corresponding equations. This is the equations for the silent pole synchronous generator and these are the equations for the silent pole synchronous motor. So now we will discuss another important concept which is called as the input of the synchronous motor. So we will discuss the different types of expressions of the input of the, of the synchronous motor and the output of the synchronous motor. We have already told you the input of the synchronous motor. The expression, the fundamental expression is equal to V bar is equal to EF bar plus IA bar into KS bar. And I have already told you if you take EF as a reference vector, then definitely as I have already told you here V bar will be always, V bar will be, you can say V bar will be always leading with respect to EF in a synchronous motor. E bar will be always leading with respect to EF in a synchronous motor. And the angle between the E bar and the EF bar is called as the delta. And I have already told you the impedance triangle of the ZS, which is RA, XS and mod of the depth. The angle is called as the theta S. So therefore, RA is equal to mod of ZS cos theta S and XS is equal to mod of ZS sin theta S. So what is the expression of the current IA bar? IA bar is equal to V bar minus EF bar by ZS bar. If V bar is equal, let me take V bar as the reference vector. So therefore, mod of V at an angle of 0 degree minus. EF bar is nothing but, with respect to V bar, EF bar is lagging. Therefore, mod of EF at an angle of minus delta Y. And, and ZS bar you can write which is mod of ZS at an angle of theta S. So these are the expressions that we are going to get. And now, if I go into, split into like this, which is IA bar is equal to mod of V at an angle of 0 by mod of ZS at an angle of theta S by minus mod of ES by angle of mod of ZS at an angle of minus theta minus theta S. If I take conjugate, if I take conjugate means I will take here minus by plus. So here, here I am going to get plus theta S. Here actually it is a minus delta minus theta S. So if you take conjugate again it is a positive positive. So therefore delta plus theta S. So this is the perfect armature current we are going to get. I a bar conjugate is equal to mod of V at an angle of theta S by mod of delta S minus mod of EF by mod of delta S at an angle of delta plus theta S. So EF bar is equal to mod of EF at an angle of minus delta. V bar is equal to mod of V at an angle of 0 degree. And delta S bar is equal to mod of delta S at an angle of theta S. So now, if you want to know what is the, the complex input power per, per phase, if you want to know what is the expression of the complex input power per phase, which is V bar, IA bar will conjugate. So therefore, this is called as a complex form which is input per phase. It is a per phase diagram. So therefore, we are going to get the expression per per phase. The complex input per per phase is equal to V bar, IA bar will conjugate. We know the value of the IA bar conjugate. And V bar also we know which is mod of V at an angle of 0. Now we need to do the multiplication of these two vectors. Then we are going to get a complex expression. And then we have to, then we have to, uh, then we have to slip, split into real part and the imaginary part. The real part is called as the active power and the imaginary part is called the reactive power. So finally we are going to get the active power input power, the active power which is input per phase is equal to mod of V whole square by mod of the S, cos of the S minus 
mode of V into uh, mode of E of Y, mode of Z into cos of delta plus theta S. Mod V is called as the, the supply voltage per phase value and then put Z is called as the magnitude of the internal impedance and delta is called as the impedance angle and also the delta is called as the angle between the EF and the V. Similarly, the reactive power input per phase is equal to mod of V whole square by mod of Z sin delta S minus mod of V mod of EF by mod of Z into sin of delta plus theta S. If you remember this equation, just replace cos by sin, you are going to get this expression. So therefore, mod of V square by mod of Z S cos of theta S minus mod V into mod of EF by mod of Z into cos of delta plus theta S. The reactive power is just replaced cos by sin, you are going to get the reactive power per phase. So these are the very complex equations. But now, but let me assume some approximations to make it very simpler one. Now I am going to assume that the now by neglecting the RA, I am going to neglect the RA, which is called as the, the armature resistance, it's a very less value, I have already told you. So we are going to neglect it. Then we are going to get only the reactive power. So therefore Gds is equal to mod of Gds at an angle of 90 degree because now theta is equal to 90 degree and mod of Gds is equal to x s because only x is present. So therefore theta x is equal to 90 degree and mod of Gds is equal to x s. So if you substitute theta x is equal to 90 degree and the mod of Gds is equal to x s in the above expression we are going to get in this format. As you can see clearly here, if you substitute cos 90, if you substitute cos 90, we are going to get cos 90 is nothing but 0. Here cos of 90 plus delta, cos of 90 plus delta is minus sin delta, so minus into minus again plus. So finally you are going to get the input power per phase, the input power per phase, it is a per phase equation. So we, these are the per phase for this because we are going to take for the single phase circuit because we are, we are we are analyzing for per phase circuit. So whatever the expression that we are going to get, these are the per phase values itself. So therefore, the active power input is equal to mod of P into mod of E F by mod of Z S sin of delta. The delta is the angle between the V and the E F. And the Q, the active power input power is equal to mod of V whole square by mod, mod of X S sin 90 is nothing but 1 minus mod V into mod E F by mod of X S into cos delta because sin of 90 plus delta is equal to cos delta. So therefore, you are going to get this expression which is called as the the per phase active power input and per phase reactive power input to the synchronous motor which is the active power the, the per phase uh, active power input is equal to mod V into mod EF by mod XS sin delta and the the per phase reactive power input is equal to mod V whole square by mod XS minus mod V into mod EF by mod XS into cos delta. So these are the active power and the reactive power which is given from the input side. These are the per phase quantities. Similarly, if you want to know the expression of the output of the synchronous motor, if you want to know how much amount of output, output power which is received by the synchronous motor, then what is the output power? Output is equal to A bar I A bar whole conjugate. So you know the I A bar I A bar conjugate expression and you also know A bar, A bar is equal to mod of A at an angle of minus delta. So now you have to multiply these two equations. Then finally you have to split the you have to you, you have to split the real you have to split the real part and the imaginary part and finally you are going to get in this format which is called as the the active power the per phase active power output is equal to mod of EF into mod of V by mod of Gs cos of Gs minus delta minus mod of EF whole square by mod of Gs cos of Gs it is called as a mechanical output power it is a per phase mechanical output power because because of this power only it is going to keep the rotation of the shaft and the perfect active power is equal to mod of EF into mod of V by mod of Z S into sine of theta S minus delta minus mod of EF whole square by mod of Z S sine of theta S. So these are the equations that we are going to get whenever R is not equal to 0. But now I want to make it very simpler equations. So now I am going to neglect the R A. Then we are going to get Z S is equal to mod of Z S at an angle of 90 degree and mod of Z S is equal to X S and theta s is equal to 90 degree. So therefore, theta s is equal to 90 degree. So if you substitute theta s is equal to 90 degree, cos of 90 minus delta is equal to sin delta. So cos of 90 minus delta is equal to sin delta. Here cos 90 is equal to 0. So this expression is going to become 0. Similarly, if you substitute here also, cos of 90 minus delta is sin, cos, sin of 90 minus delta is cos delta. 
and sign 90 is 1. You are going to get in this format. So finally, you are going to get the, the perfect act to power output is equal to mod of EF mod of V by mod of data sign delta. And the perfect act to power the act to power output is equal to mod of EF mod of V by mod of data. Here it is a mod JDS is nothing but your excess. Here actually it is the excess. Here it is a excess. Cos delta minus mod of EF whole square by this is excess. So these are the expressions that we are going to get whenever the but whenever we are going to neglect the array, which is the perfect output power, the perfect active power output, uh, the perfect active power output is mod of V into mod of V by mod of excess sine delta, and the perfect active power output is equal to reactive power output is equal to mod of EF into mod of V by mod of excess cos delta minus mod of EF whole square by excess. So these are the perfect equations that you always need to keep in mind. And if you see one important question, suppose if you if you see one important point, let me tell you, suppose if R is not equal to 0, if R is not equal to 0, then I can say that the input power, the, the perfect input power is not equal to perfect output power, and the perfect reactive power input is not equal to perfect reactive power output power. So these are the things that you always need to understand. Whenever the R is not equal to 0, the perfect input power is not equal to the perfect to power, the, the perfect output active power and the perfect input reactive power is not equal to perfect reactive output power whenever the R is not equal to 0. But if R is equal to 0, the perfect input power is equal to the perfect output power which is active in nature and the perfect reactive power is not equal to the perfect reactive output power. So, the, 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 so this is a very important point that you always need to keep in mind which is whenever the whenever the R is not equal to 0, the perfect the perfect active input power is not equal to the perfect active output power. Similarly, the perfect reactive output power is not equal to the perfect reactive input power. If R is equal to 0, then the perfect active input power is equal to perfect active output power and the perfect reactive input power is not equal to perfect reactive output power. So these are the things that you always need to keep in mind. So whenever the R is equal to 0, the active power, the perfect active power input is equal to perfect active power output is equal to mod of V into mod of EF by mod of XS into sine delta. So therefore, the easy way to remember which is, see the, the perfect active power input is equal to perfect active power output is equal to mod of, mod of V into mod of EF by mod of XS into sine delta. Similarly, the reactive power, the perfect reactive power input is equal to initially inputs at the input side means it is a V. So therefore mod of V whole square by mod of excess minus mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into cos delta. If you want the active power output just to the interchange of this equation, keep it here and keep it this one to here with some modification replace E V by E EF. So you are going to get finally mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into cos delta minus mod of EF whole square by excess. So this is a very important way that you always need to keep in mind whenever you are solving these equations. So therefore the perfect active power input is equal to perfect active power output power is equal to mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into sine delta and the perfect reactive power input is equal to mod of V whole square by excess minus mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into cos delta. And the reactive power, the perfect reactive power output power is equal to mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into cos delta minus mod of EF whole square by mod of excess. So these are the points that you always need to keep in mind. So therefore we can say that simply the perfect input power, the perfect input power is equal to perfect output power whenever the R is is equal to 0 which is mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into sine delta. And the perfect a reactive input power is equal to mod of V whole square by mod of excess minus mod of V into mod of EF by mod of excess into cos delta and the perfect reactive power output is equal to mod of V into mod of EF cos delta by mod of excess minus mod of EF whole square by excess. So th these are the points that you always need to keep in mind before doing the simplification of this one. So now we will discuss one more important point here. What is the condition? What is the condition for maximum output power? So, what is the condition for the maximum output power? The maximum output power you are going to get whenever the the maximum output power you are going to get whenever the delta is equal to theta s. So, whenever the 
the delta is equal to theta s. Whenever the delta is equal to theta s, you are going to get the maximum output power. The maximum active output power you are going to get. The maximum output power that you are going to get whenever the delta is equal to theta s. So whenever the delta is equal to theta s, that you are going to get the maximum perfect output power. So therefore, if you substitute delta is equal to theta s, see whenever the delta is equal to theta s in the general expression, which is whenever the R is not equal to zero, whenever R is not equal to zero. Then definitely you are going to get the expression which is the active power of the perfect active power output is equal to which is mod of E F into mod of V by mod of Z S which is delta delta is equal delta S means cos of zero is equal to one minus mod of E F whole square by mod of Z S cos delta S. So this is the equation that you are going to get if you substitute delta is equal delta S. And if you want the three phase three phase output power, it is a per phase. So you need the three phase means three times of this one. So three times of output maximum power you are going to get the the output power three phase maximum power is equal to it is a single phase output maximum power so you have to go for the three times then you are going to get the the, the output power of a three phase maximum which is nothing but three times the output power maximum value because it's a single phase equation so you have to multiply by three in order to get the maximum output power of this three phase system which is three times the output power of the maximum output power of a single phase system. So this is the output power general expression. Whenever the R is not equal to zero, then I can say that in this equation, I want to know what is the maximum output power. Whenever the delta is equal to theta s, you are going to get the maximum output power. So if you substitute delta is equal to theta s, this cos zero is equal to one, and the remaining expressions you are going to get. And now what I am going to say, say that there is a maximum output power of a per phase, but we want for three phases, so we have to go for the three times. That is what I am trying to tell you from the starting onwards. So this is the expression of the maximum output power. So the, the, this is the final expression of the maximum output power of a three-phase system, which is three times the maximum output power of a. So now we'll discuss one more important concept, which is called as the the role of the reactive power flow in the alternator. See these things I've already told you in a somewhat summary manner, but now I will discuss. What is the exact way? What is the nature of the the reactive particles? The role of the reactive power in alternator. These things I've already told you in the previous uh, class only, which is whenever the alternator is going to operate in the over excitation, it is going to act in a lagging region. At the normal excitation, it is going to act like a unity power factor, whereas at the under excitation, it is going to act like a leading power factor. These things I've already told you, and in the lagging Region, or we can say, lower excitation, it is going to generate the reactive power. We can say the lagging reactive power is being supplied by the generator to the bus bars. Whereas in the under excited mode, it is going to absorb the, it is going to absorb the leading reactive power. These things I have already told you. But let me discuss in detail each and every aspect. The role of reactive power flow in the alternator. So whenever the its voltage by frequency is a constant. Then we can say area of flux is also constant because V by F is nothing but the magnetic flux density. So magnetic flux density is directly proportional to voltage by frequency. Whenever the voltage by frequency is a constant, the magnetic flux density is a constant. So therefore, the area of flux is also constant. Then the Q changes to make phi is equal to constant. Then we need to change the reactive power to make the phi is equal to constant. How? How is that this possible? We are going to see. See, whenever the E F cos delta is greater than V, E F cos delta means we can simply say that in the over excitation, or we can say in the over excitation, these things I have already told you. In the over excitation, only E F is always greater than V. The amount of E F is always greater than amount of V in the over excitation, or simply we can say E F cos delta is greater than V. But delta is the load angle between the E F and the V. It is called as the over excitation. Over excitation means I have already told you the current I A, the current I A is going to lag the V. The current I A is going to lag the V, so it is called as a lagging power factor region. And whenever in a lagging, the synchronous generator will have the demagnetization effect. So what the overall energy of flux is going to get decreased, which is phi of minus phi A. So therefore, the overall energy of flux is going to phi of minus phi A. Let me assume the energy of flux is 10 millivolt. But I suppose if the field flux is, if the field current is producing a, if the field current is producing a, a flux, let me assume which is 12 millivolt. But and the armature current is going to generate a flux which is 2 millivolt. But and because of demagnetization, we need to do subtraction. 
So 12 minus 2 is nothing but 10 milli wave bar. So this field winding, this field winding should compensate, this field winding should compensate both the, this field winding should compensate both the air gap flux and also the armature flux because it is the thing which is mainly useful. So 5F is, so 5F is used for, so 5F is used for air gap flux and also the 5F because 5F is equal to 5 air gap plus 5A. So therefore, 5F is 12 is equal to 10 plus 2. So 10 is used for the air gap flux and 2 is used for the 5A. So 5F is used to produce two things, which is called as the air gap flux and also the 5A. So 5 air gap flux is to maintain air gap flux as a constant. It is going to make air gap flux as a constant because always we need the air gap flux as a constant value. And 5A is called as a used to deliver reactive power to bus bar. So this 5A is responsible to deliver the reactive power to bus bar. So this 5A is responsible for delivering the reactive power to the bus bar. Because I have already told you one important point which is if you listen carefully in a power excitation mode it is going to generate the it is going to generate the lagging reactive power. So therefore it is used to deliver the reactive power to the bus bar. It is basically the lagging reactive power to the bus bar. It is going to use to deliver the lagging reactive power the, the lagging reactive power to the bus bar. So therefore the 5F is 12, this is a 10 and this is 2. So 10 should be always constant. So therefore this value should be always equal to constant and this 2 is used for producing the it is used for producing the reactive delivering the reactive lagging reactive power to the bus bar. So we can say that whenever the alternator is at the over excitation, over excitation means EF cos theta, EF cos delta is greater than B. So therefore it is said to be lagging power factor because IA is going to lag the B. So part of the field flux is utilized to maintain the constant air gap flux and the remaining field flux delivers the reactive power to bus bar because 5F is equal to 5 air gap flux plus 5A. So 12 milli bar is mostly split into two bars, 10 plus 2. So 10 is used for to maintain the constant area of flux and the 2 mm bar is used to be delivering the reactive power to the bus bar. So this is the concept that you always need to understand. So therefore, whenever the alternator is operated at the over excitation means the field current is very very huge value, then we can say that the part of the field flux is used to utilize, it is utilized to maintain the constant area of flux and the remaining field flux, field flux delivers the reactive power to bus bar. So now we will go for the another case which is called as the under excitation. Suppose if the field current is very less then definitely EF cos delta is less than B. So this is called as the under excitation. Under excitation means the current IA is going to lead the terminal voltage. So this is called as the leading power factor. And see in the leading power factor I have already told you in a synchronous machine we are going to get a mad addition effect. These things I have already told you. So we are going to get the mad addition effect. So now we will see what is going to happen. So therefore, as it is a mad addition of so therefore resulting energy of flux is equal to 5F plus 5A. Let me assume, let me assume the constant air gap flux is 10 milli bar we need. So this air gap flux should be always constant, no matter what are the other values. This value should be always constant is 10 milli bar. But this field flux is generating only 7 milli bar. So therefore, this remaining, this remaining 3 milli bar should be accepted from the other sources. So therefore, this 3 milli bar is utilized to make to get this 10 milli bar. So therefore, we can say the field winding is producing only 7 milli bar, but we need extra 3 milli bar to get overall value as 10. So this is the concept that you need to always be keep in mind. So therefore, we can say that extra 3 milli bar is required to generate this overall flux. This value should be always equal to constant. So this value should be always equal to constant, which is 10 milli bar. In the previous case also it is 10, 10 milli bar. Here also it should be always 10 milli bar. But this field flux is going to generate only 7 milli bar. So extra 3 milli bar is required to make this value as a constant, which is 10 milli bar. So therefore it is going to accept the reactive power from the outside world. So therefore we can say it is it is going to accept the reactive power, which is basically leading reactive power. It is going to accept the leading reactive power from the bus bars or we can from node. So therefore we can say here it is going to accept the reactive power. So therefore here but here if you see clearly here if the field winding is of 12, 12 mW bar so therefore here we need only 10. So extra 2 it is utilized to make the generating the reactive power. So therefore it has extra 2 it is used to generate see out of this 12 10 is used for 10 is used for 
produce the constant air gap flux and the remaining two it is used for making the for producing the reactive power whereas in the whereas in the whereas in this case we can see clearly it has only it need 10 mw but we have only seven but we need extra three so we are going to accept the reactive power reactive power from the outside wall so therefore three mw bar is taken from the outside wall to get the air gap flux as a constant so whenever the alternator is operating at the under excitation so field flux is not sufficient to maintain constant air gap flux thereby to maintain the constant air gap flux alternator takes the reactive power from the bus bar so therefore whenever the alternator is operating at the under excitation means it is called as the leading then field flux doesn't help the field flux is not sufficient to maintain the constant air gap flux thereby to maintain constant air gap flux alternator takes the reactive power from the bus bar because the field the field flux is not sufficient to satisfy the air gap flux so we need extra flux from armature so therefore it is going to accept the reactive power to produce a three mw bar so therefore we can say it is going to accept the reactive power from the outside wall or we can say from the outside bus bars so whenever the alternator is operating at the under excitation the field flux is not sufficient to maintain the constant air gap flux thereby to maintain the constant air gap flux the alternator takes the reactive power from the bus bar so now we will see the other case which is called as the normal excitation means whenever the ef cos delta is equal to v it is called as the normal excitation in this case we can see clearly the angle between v and ia is nothing but 0 degree so it is called as the upf see at the whenever the normal excitation means ef cos delta is equal to v we can say clearly the angle between v and ia is equal to 0 degree so therefore it is called as the unity power factor so therefore The angle between the V and I is nothing but zero degree, so it is called as the UD power factor. Then at UD power, power factor, there will be only there will be only cross magnetization, so therefore the resultant air gap flux is equal to field flux itself. There is no there is neither magnetization, there is no ma there is ne neither magnetization, there is neither demagnetization. There is only field flux is going to present only cross magnetization means the flux is going only uh, it is only going to be discharged, but it will never decrease its magnitude. So the resulting air gap flux is equal to phi f. So when the alternator is operating at the normal excitation, the entire field flux is utilized to maintain the constant air gap flux. Thereby, alternator neither delivers the reactive power nor absorbs the reactive power from the outside wall. So at the normal excitation, part of the field flux it is totally utilized to generate the air gap flux. So therefore, we can say that it is it is not even taking any reactive power or delivering the reactive power at this normal excitation. so whenever the alternator is operating at normal excitation entire field flux is utilized to maintain the constant air gap flux thereby alternator neither delivers the reactive power neither absorbs the reactive power so finally i am going to conclude the concept for the synchronous machine in general for alternator and motor so we have learned about the alternator so now we'll summarize the concepts for both alternator and motor see under the over excitation i have already told you Over excitation means over excitation means the magnitude of E F is always greater than the magnitude of V. So this is a very important point that you always need to keep understand. So therefore, over excitation means always the magnitude of E F is always greater than the magnitude of V. And I've already told you alternator in the over excitation is going to act like a lagging power factor. So lagging power factor means we are going to get demagnetization. So therefore, I already told you it is going to deliver the reactive power, which is it is going to deliver the lagging reactive power, or simply we can say it is delivers the reactive power. Then synchronous motor in the over excitation, it is going to act in opposite manner. If it is lagging, it is a leading power factor. Then I already told you here. So this is called as a demagnetization. But I already told you at leading power factor there will be demagnetization. So you can see clearly only the power factor is changing. But the concept is same. But the concept is same. Same demagnetization. So therefore, we can say the resultant flux will decrease. So therefore, we, we so therefore the resultant flux decrease. So therefore, we can say that it is going to generate the reactive power. So see only the power factor of the motor. We can say motor armature is changing, but the concept is same. But the effects are same. So both are going to do the same functions, but only the power factors are going to get changed. Similarly, at the under excitation, at the under excitation, I already told you, at under excitation, the alternator is going to act in a under the under excitation means I already told you, mod of E F is less than mod of V. Then we can say that the alternator is going to act in a leading power factor. So therefore, simply we can say that it is said to be 
magnetization. So magnetization means it is going to absorb the reactive power from the outside bowl. So it is going to absorb the reactive power from the outside bowl or from the bus bar. For synchronous motor, the power factor is going to change just for the lagging power factor. But the effects are same, but the effects are still the same, which is same magnetization effects and the, it is also going to absorb the reactive power. At the normal excitation means EF cos delta is equal to P. It is called as the normal excitation. So therefore it is, it is also called as the UPF. So then we can say that here the alternator is going to act like a UPF and only the cross magnetization is going to affect neither demandation or neither magnetization. So therefore it is neither going to absorb the or the send the it is neither absorbing the active power or delivering the reactive power. So neither absorbs nor delivers the reactive power. So for synchronous motor, same phenomena. It is again UPF, we also UPF. Same cross magnetization, same things are going to happen. So finally I can say that for a given excitation, the only the power factors of the synchronous motor and generators are going to change, but the remaining everything is same. The concept of magnetization, the concept of reactive power, everything is same. Only the power factors are going to get altered, but the concepts are same. So this is a point that you always need to keep in mind. So therefore, so therefore we can say that for synchronous machine, whether it is the alternator or motor, for over excitation, I have already told you, EF cos delta is always greater than V for both the cases, for motor and alternator. So we can simply say that the mode of EF is always greater than mode of P. For under, for under excitation, EF cos delta is less than V or simply we can say mode of EF is always less than mode of V. At normal excitation, mode of EF cos delta is equal to V, so always mode of EF is always equal to mode of V. So this is a case that you always need to keep in mind. And for a singular generator, we are going to use that theta is equal to mod, mod of it's an angle of V comma IA. So with respect to this one, we are going to say leading, lagging or unity power factor. If the current IA is leading V, it is called as leading power factor. And when the current IA is lagging V, it is called as a lagging power factor. And then when, when the current IA is with respect to V, the same way it is called as UPF with respect to alternator. Whereas for motor, we are going to define the power factor with respect to this phi, so therefore psi. So therefore whenever the IA leads here, it is called as the leading power factor. And whenever the IA lags here, it is called as the lagging power factor. And whenever the IA is in place with EF, it is called as the unity power factor. So for alternator, we define the power factor with respect to theta. And for motor, we define the power factor with respect to psi. So this is a very important concept that you always need to understand. For alternator motor, only the lag, only the power factors are going to get changed. But the concept is same. The demandation effects and the amount of reactive power, everything is same. So now we will discuss another important concept which is called as the effect of varying the excitation of synchronous motor at no load. So now we will see for the motor case. At no load condition, we will see what is the motor case that we are going to see in this detailed manner. So therefore here, as I have already told you, over excitation means, it is over excitation means whenever the EF cos delta is greater than V, it is called as the over excitation. Means the field current is very very high, then only we are going to get this condition which is EF into cos delta is greater than V. Then I have already told you in a synchronous motor, the expression is equal to V is equal to EF plus J into IA into XS. Always V is going to lead the EF. All, always V is going to always lead the EF. This concept I have already told you in the synchronous motor itself. I am going to assume that ZS having, we are going to neglect the, in ZS we are going to neglect the RA. So, ZS is nearly equal to XS. So, RA is neglected. See, at no load what is going to happen? Basically, at no load condition, delta is nearly equal to zero. At no load means if you are not going to keep any load, then definitely we can say that the angle between the EF and V is very, 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 very small. So, simply we are going to assume it as nearly equal to zero degree. So, therefore, and I have already told you, very important point which is always in the over excitation always EF is always greater than V. Irrespective of the load always EF is always greater than V. So therefore then only the current can flow from EF to V because over excitation means then only, the only current can go from EF to V. So therefore EF and V are in phase with respect to each other because at no load delta is nearly equal to zero. So EF and V are quietly we can say but not exactly but we can say they are in phase with respect to each other. Then I have already told the expression of IA. IA is equal to V minus EF by J into XS. As you can see clearly, as I have already told you, EF is very higher than V in this case. So therefore, we can say whenever the EF is greater than V, whatever the current you are going to get, it is called as the negative current. The IA is called as the armature current which is negative in fashion. 
or simply we can say like this minus 5 by j into x else. So if you multiply by j and j, you are going to get here plus 5 j by x else means plus 5 by x else at an angle of 20 degree is a positive phase shift. So therefore current i is going to lead the this voltage by 90 degree. So current is going to lead here. So you can see clearly the current i is leading the the current i is leading the which is called as the EF. So therefore we can say it is the leading power factor. That is the reason I have already told you synchronous motor under the over excitation is going to act like a leading power factor because they are IA is leading the EF. So it is called as the leading power factor. Then what is the expression of reactive power? Reactive power expression I have already told you the amount of reactive power which is the amount of reactive power input to the synchronous motor. The amount of reactive power input to the synchronous motor, the expression I have already told you, which is V square by Xs minus V into EF by Xs into cos delta. So this expression I have already told you, this is the input power to the synchronous, or we can say it is a input power given by the supply to the synchronous motor, which is called as the here. This is the expression. See, whenever the input to synchronous motor is negative, because you can see clearly that EF cos delta is greater than V. So therefore, this overall value is negative. So input to synchronous motor is equal to negative means synchronous motor delivering the reactive power to bus bar because the input is not giving. So therefore input is positive means the bus bar is giving the reactive power to motor but input is negative means the motor itself is giving the re reactive power to the bus bar. So this is a very important point. You can see clearly here in, if the reactive power is a positive means the bus bar is giving the reactive power to synchronous motor but this negative which indicates that the synchronous motor is giving the reactive power to the bus bar. So this is called as a reactive power input to the motor. It is a negative. So therefore, means the synchronous motor is delivering the reactive power to the bus bar. These things I have already told you. So therefore, that is the reason over excited synchronous motor is going to behave like a capacitor because capacitor is going to deliver the reactive power. So therefore, over excited synchronous motor is going to behave like a capacitor whenever we are not going to keep any load. So under no load condition, this is possible. So under no load condition only, we can say that the, uh, under the no load condition, in the over excited mode, the synchronous motor is going to act like a, the synchronous motor is going to act like a capacitor. So by using synchronous condenser, which is also called as the over excited synchronous motor, under no load condition, the power factor, the power factor of the system can be increased. So therefore, simply we can say that under no load, if you do the over excitation of a synchronous motor, it is going to behave like a capacitor. So therefore, by using the synchronous capacitor, or you can say synchronous condenser, means the over excited synchronous motor at no load condition, the power factor of the system can be increased because it can deliver the reactive power. So whatever the input power from the mains, the reactive power power can be decreased. So therefore, we are going to increase the power factor of the mains. So this is what I am trying to tell you. So therefore, with the help of this, with the help of this synchronous motor at no load condition, we can say simply that it is going to deliver the reactive power to the bus bars. So therefore, so the net amount of reactive power from the mains can be decreased. So therefore, we can say that we are going to improve the power factor of the system. The practical system, synchronous condenser is used only for improvement of power factor and no mechanical output is collected, thereby size of the rotor is small and shaft length is less. This is a very important point. You should connect, you should not connect any load. It is at no load condition. Only at no load condition, this is possible with a very good effect. So in the practical system, synchronous connector is used for only improvement of power factor and no mechanical output is connected. Means we are not going to connect any load to the shaft. Thereby, the size of the rotor is small and the shaft is also very less. You can say that the overall shaft size is very less and the shaft is also very less for the synchronous motor and the over excitation case because we are not going to connect any load. So this is a very important point that you always need to keep in mind. So therefore, I have already told you in the over excited state, I have already told you in the previous case only under the over excited condition, EF cos delta is always greater than B. Then the synchronous motor is going to act in a leading power factor. Means the current IA is going to lead the EF. I have already told this important point. So therefore, we can say it is going to deliver the reactive power. So this synchronous motor is going to deliver the reactive power to the mains. So therefore, we can say that it is going to increase the overall power factor at no load condition. So this is the very important point. Synchronous condenser means it is a power exited synchronous motor at the no load condition. This is going to be basically used for improving the power factor of the system. So this is what I am trying to tell you from starting onwards, which is 
over excited synchronous motor it is going to be of the capacitor so bias and synchronous condenser the over excited the over excited synchronous motor the power factor system can be increased so in the practical system synchronous condenser is used for only for improvement of power factor and no mechanical output is granted means you are not going to get any mechanical output load thereby the size of the rotor is small and the shaft length is very less so now we'll see what is going to happen for the under excitation so under the at under excitation i've already told you ef constant is always less than b whether it is a motor or whether it is a alternator it is called as under excitation is possible only for whenever the ef is very less so we can say that simply here i've already told the expression of the synchronous motor which is v is equal to ef plus j into i into xs at no load I, here also i am going to assume it as no load condition at no load condition delta is nearly equal to zero so delta is nearly equal to zero but i am going to assume this delta is exactly equal to zero so therefore so all i told you mod of pf is always less than b at under excitation whether it is a mod or alternator then what is the current of ia ia is equal to v minus ef by j into xs so we can say it is a positive value it is basically a positive value so therefore it is plus 5 so let me assume this is plus 5 by jx j So if you do the multiplication by j and j, you are going to get minus. Simply we can say that we are going to get. If you go for the simplification, this is five by j x s means five by x s at an angle of minus ninety degree. If you take angle, it is upward. So therefore the current I is lagging. So current I is lagging the current I is lagging which one? Current I is lagging the the E F. So therefore simply we can say that it is said to be lagging power factor. So therefore the, that is the reason. Under excitation, the synchronous motor is going to act like a lagging, lagging power factor. As you can see clearly, the current I is lagging here, so it is called as the lagging power factor. That is the reason under the at under excitation, the synchronous motor is going to act in a lagging. Under excitation, the synchronous motor is going to act in a lagging power factor because the power factor is different with respect to I and the E of the synchronous motor. So therefore, we can say simply that say that. So this is the case it is going to be possible and what is the reactive power which is input to the synchronous motor which is v square by xs minus v into ef by xs into cos delta these things i have already told you so therefore if you see clearly that ef cos delta is less than v so therefore this value is a positive so therefore input to synchronous motor is equal to positive means motor is going to absorb the reactive power from the bus bar so it is going to absorb the reactive power from the bus bar so it is going to accept the reactive power from the bus bar so therefore simply we can say that at the under excitation synchronous motor is going to be as the inductor to compensate the ferranti effect so therefore at the under excitation we can say that the synchronous motor is going to operate in the lagging power factor so it is going to act like a pure inductive load so therefore it is going to accept the reactive power from the bus bars and we can say it is going to use to compensate the ferranti effect so therefore at under excitation the synchronous motor at no load condition see both the for over excitation and under and under excitation we should not connect any mechanical load so therefore at under excitation synchronous motor is going to be used as the inductor to compensate the ferranti effect so this is a very important point that you always need to keep to understanding this one and the power factor is defined with respect to ef and the ia for the motor and for the generator we define the power factor with respect to v and ia this point i also have already told you so finally i can say that the synchronous motor at the over excitation it is going to act in a leading power factor so therefore it is going to generate the reactive power to the bus bar whereas at the under excitation it is going to act like a lagging power factor so therefore it is going to accept the reactive power so therefore it is going to act like a inductive load and it is used for compensating the ferranti effect so this is actually called as a, the reactive power input to the supply of this to the supply of this synchronous motor the input supply reactive power is a positive so therefore it is generating the bus bar is generating the reactive power to the synchronous motor so it is absorbing so therefore the synchronous motor is going to absorb this amount of reactive power from the bus bar this is what i am trying to tell you so now at normal excitation means whenever the ef cos delta is equal to v i have already told you at no load delta is nearly equal to zero so therefore ef is equal to v so at uh, i have already told you at no load condition at no load condition delta is equal to zero so therefore ef is equal to v then i have already told you here v is equal to ef plus j ia xs so ia is equal to v minus ef plus j xs as both are equal its value is equal to zero so ia is equal to zero then what is the reactive power input which is v square by xs minus v into ef by xs into cos delta then definitely we are going to get it is equal to zero because 
delta is equal to 0 and f is equal to v. So this value we are going to get as a 0. So it is going to neither absorbs or neither delivers the reactive power. So this is a very important point that you always need to keep understanding the concept. So therefore we can say this is a very important point. So therefore it is going to neither absorbs nor delivers the reactive power in this case. It is going to neither absorb the reactive power, neither absorb the active power. So therefore it is going to neither absorbs or delivers the reactive power in this case. And always the current IA is in always phase with respect to EF in this case. So it is called as a unity power factor. So IA is always in phase with respect to EF. So we can say this is said to be a, a unity power factor. This is said to be a unity power factor because power factor is defined with respect to which is called as a EF and IA which is called as a psi. So as psi is equal to 0, we can say it is said to be power factor is equal to unity. So this is the expression of the amount of reactive power which is input. So as it is equal to 0, we can say it is neither absorbs nor delivers the reactive power. So now we will discuss another important concept which is called as the effect of varying the excitation of synchronous motor with constant load. Suppose if I am going to keep a constant load for the synchronous motor and then I am going to vary the excitation of the field winding. If I increase the field winding, it means that I am increasing the excitation. Then what are the things which are going to happen? What are the consequences because of this excitation that we are going to see for this synchronous motor? The effect of varying the excitation of the synchronous motor with constant load means we are going to keep the load as a constant but we are going to change the excitation and then we are going to see what is the consequences that are going to occur. As I already told you, if you are going to increase the excitation means the flux increases, whenever the flux increases, EMF induced the per phase RMS value also increases. So we can simply say that whenever the excitation increases, EF value increases. And we are going to connect this synchronous motor to the bus bar. So bus bar voltage is always constant. So therefore the supply voltage is always equal to constant. And then we are going to see what are the effects are going to occur. Let me take a first case which is called as the so this is the supply voltage and I have already told you in a synchronous motor EF is always going to lag the V. If I take this as the reference value which is always the constant and this is the first one which is EF1. EF1 plus I can I have already told you which is IA1. So IA1 is the current which is lagging the EF1. So therefore IA1 into J axis. So therefore IA1 into axis you are going to get perpendicular like here. So if you add these two vectors you are going to get the overall voltage. So therefore V is equal to EF bar plus J into IA into axis. So therefore by using that principle we are going to get the summation of this vector and this vector is called as the, the supply voltage V. So this is the voltage that you are going to get here. As you can see clearly as I already told you whenever whenever the IA lags EF is called as the lagging power factor. So you can see clearly the IA is lagging the EF1. So always the current is lagging EF so it is called as the lagging power factor. So now again I increase the excitation. Again I increase the excitation then again what is going to happen. So whenever I increase the excitation then the, let me assume a second case of EF2. Then this is the IA2 current is going to occur. So this is the IA2 and if I do the J into XIA2, so therefore J into IA2 into XS, you are going to get in this manner. So if we add these two vectors, we are going to get the supply voltage V. Again, I increase the excitation, then the current IA is going to happen in this manner. So therefore, EF3 is going to increase its magnitude. And if you go the addition of this vector with the IA3 XS, you are going to get in this direction. So if we add these two vectors, we are going to get supply voltage as constant value. So in this region, you can see clearly the current is lagging the EF value. So therefore, we say it is a lagging power factor. But here, the current is leading the EF value. So it is said to be a leading power factor. So this is the word that you always need to keep understanding this one. So whenever the excitation increases, the current is moving from lagging power factor to leading power factor. That is the reason at the under excitation, at the under excitation, I have already told you at the under excitation, I have already told you which is EF cos delta is less than V. So if you take the component of EF on this X axis, then you can see clearly the angle between them is delta. So EF cos delta is less than V. So it is called as the under excitation. Then I have already told you in the under excitation, the power factor of the synchronous motor is, it is lagging. You can see clearly the current is 
lagging here. So it is always lagging. But as the excitation increases, the F the, the, the F value increases. So at a particular place, you can see clearly the EF, or you can say that as the EF two cos delta is equal to V. So at this condition, you can see clearly the EF two cos delta is equal to V. It is called as a normal excitation. Again, if you increase the EF. You can say clearly the current is in the current is in the leading manner with respect to EF. So it is called as the leading power factor. So at the over excitation, the power factor of the synchronous motor is the leading, and at the under excitation, the power factor of the synchronous motor is lagging. As you can see clearly from this diagram, the phase diagram itself. And one more thing is here, uh, whenever the excitation increases, the EF value increases and the supply voltage is a constant and the delta value decreases, as you can see clearly from here. As I have already told you, the mechanical power is equal to the mechanical. The load is a constant value. So, what are the active powers? And it is constant because with the excitation, we can only change the EF value, but not the P. So, P is a constant. So, P is equal to mod V into mod EF by X S into sine delta. Mod V is a constant. EF is also increasing, and the X is a constant. So, therefore, P should be constant. So, therefore, P is a constant only whenever the so P is constant only when the EF sine is constant. So, therefore, you can say clearly. This is EF one sine delta one is sine delta one is equal to EF two sine delta two is equal to EF three sine delta three. You can see clearly from here because P is equal to mod V into mod EF by X S into sine delta. Mod V is a constant, X S is constant, P is a constant. So therefore, definitely that the mod EF into sine delta should be always constant. So therefore, EF one sine delta one is equal to EF two sine delta two is equal to EF three sine delta three. So this is the thing that you always need to keep in mind. So whenever the excitation increases, so whenever the excitation increases, the EF value increases, and the current is going from lagging power factor to leading power factor. Or you can simply say that the synchronous motor is moving from lagging power factor region to leading power factor region, and the delta value decreases. Always EF is always going to lag the supply voltage in a synchronous motor. So we can say clearly as excitation increases. The EF value increases, and the EF3 is greater than EF2 is greater than EF1, and the delta value decreases. We can see clearly from this diagram itself. So we can say the power factor remains this with respect to V and IA. So always we are going to always we are going to define the power factor with respect to V and IA. So always we are going to define the power factor with respect to V and IA. Whether it is a synchronous motor or whether it is a synchronous generator, always we are going to define the power factor with respect to V and I. So this is a very important point that you need to always keep in mind. So po the power factor is nothing but it is always the phase angle between the V and I. So V and I is nothing but as I have already told you, V and I is nothing but theta angle. So this theta is called as the power factor angle. So always we are going to define the power factor of a synchronous motor with respect to theta. Whether it is a synchronous motor. A synchronous generator. Always, we are going to define the power factor with respect to theta. And I already told you in a synchronous motor, V is equal to E F plus J into I into X S. So whenever the E F one cos delta one is less than V, it is called as the under excitation. And you can see clearly the current I A is lagging the V, so it is called as the lagging power factor. And I already told you in a synchronous motor, whenever the power factor is lagging, it to be mad radiation. So how much radiation is? Radiation. So I have already told you in the under excitation. So therefore, we can say it is the armature reaction is magnetization. So therefore, it is going to absorb the reactive power from the bus bars. So it is going to absorb the reactive power from the bus bars. Whether it is a synchronous motor or synchronous generator, it is going to do the same thing. It is it is going to absorb the reactive power from the bus bars, and also it is going to absorb the active power from the bus bars. So, so therefore, we can say that it is going to absorb the active power, and also it is going to absorb the reactive power from the bus bars for the synchronous motor under this under excitation condition. E F two cos delta two is equal to V. It is called as normal excitation, and you can see clearly the power factor is equal to unity because theta is the angle between the V and I. Both are in same phase. So, therefore, we can say the power factor angle is equal to zero. So, we can say this is to be unity. And the armature reaction is cross magnetization. So it only it, and and it only absorbs the active power because there is no that there is no decrease or increase in magnetization flux. So therefore we can say the overall flux is again the same thing. Only it is going to discharge, but the overall flux magnitude is again same. So we can say this is to be cross magnetization. So it is going to only absorb the active power, but it, neither it absorbs the active power, neither neither it neither it absorbs the active power or neither it delivers the reactive power. 
and whenever the F3 cos delta 3 is greater than V, so we can say it is said to be over excitation and you can see clearly the current IA is leading the supply voltage. So it is called as the leading power factor. So under the leading power factor, so we are going to get a armature reaction as demagnetization. So whenever we go for the demagnetization, so whenever we go for the demagnetization as, as I have already told you, then definitely the resultant flux will decrease. So it is going to absorb the active power and it is going to deliver the reactive power because the field flux is going to generate the uh, constant air gap flux and also it is going to give to the phi A. So therefore it is going to deliver the reactive power to the bus bar. So simply we can say that for the synchronous motor or synchronous generator at over excitation it is going to deliver the reactive power and uh, for synchronous motor or synchronous generator at the underload we can say uh, at 100 at uh, under excitation condition it is going to absorb the reactive power. As I have already told you whenever the mechanical load is constant the active power output is also constant. So P is equal to F into V by excess into sine delta. See as F is as V is a constant, excess is a constant and P is a constant definitely F into sine delta should, should be always equal to constant. So as a P is a constant, V is a constant and X is a constant definitely F sin delta should be constant. So therefore, F1 sin delta 1 is equal to F2 sin delta 2 is equal to F3 sin delta 3. So when synchronous motor is operating at lagging power factor, so you can see clearly whenever the synchronous motor is operating at the lagging power factor with a constant power output, if the excitation is increased, then you can see clearly the power factor angle decreases. Power factor angle means it is angle between the supply voltage and the supply current IA and the V. The power factor angle decreases. So therefore the power factor increases, so delta decreases, then definitely as I have already told you power factor and Q are inversely proportional, if power factor increases then Q will decrease and I have already told you the current IA, the matter of the current IA is also going to get decrease. So you have to see this process only up to the unity power factor only, so we have to see from lagging power factor to unity power factor, these are the results that are going to get occur. So as the single phase circuit, therefore you have to use this one. P is equal to VIA into cos theta. As a V is a constant and P is a constant, then definitely IA into cos theta should be always equal to constant. So you can see clearly from the phase diagram also. So you can see clearly from the phase diagram also that IA into cos theta value should be always equal irrespective of the current. So therefore, IA into cos theta, this value is always constant irrespective of this one. So we can say that, see whenever the excitation increases, the current magnitude will decrease up to the power factor again it will increase. So therefore you can see clearly up to from lagging power factor to unity power, unity power factor as the excitation increases the current magnitude will decrease. But after that, but after that the current will increase, it will increase the excitation. So this is a very important point that you always need to keep in mind. So therefore we can say that whenever the synchronous motor is operating at the lagging power factor with constant power output, if the excitation is increased then the power factor angle decreases. The power factor angle means theta. The power, the power factor angle decreases, so therefore the power factor increases and the delta decreases and the Q decreases and the IA decreases. So you have to see only up to the unity power factor only. See if nothing is mentioned then always prefer the lagging region. In the question if they have not mentioned anything then you have to prefer always the lagging region. Means you have to start your analysis from always the lagging region if they have not mentioned anything. So we can say that over excited synchronous motor and synchronous generator working in lagging power factor always both deliver the reactive power and induction motor always absorb the reactive power. See I already told you over excited synchronous motor. Over excited synchronous motor is going to act in the leading region. Over excited synchronous motor is always going to operate in the leading region and the synchronous generator working in lagging power factor always both deliver the reactive power. See I already told you over excited synchronous motor. And the synchronous generator working in lagging power factor means we can say that over excited synchronous motor is going to operate in the leading operation and the over, and the over excited synchronous generator is always going to operate in the lagging power factor. They both always going to deliver the reactive power. See always over excited synchronous motor is always going to operate in the over excited synchronous motor is always going to operate in the leading power factor and the over excited synchronous generator is always going to operate in the lagging power factor and they are both are going to deliver the reactive power to the bus bars. Whereas the induction motor always absorb the reactive power. See induction motor will always absorb the reactive power. It will never deliver the reactive power to you. It will always absorb the, act, the, the reactive power. It can only deliver the active power but not the reactive power. So induction motor will always absorb the reactive power. 
whereas a synchronous motor and synchronous generator they can absorb they can also deliver so this is a very important point that you always need to keep in mind induction motor will always absorb the reactive power whereas synchronous motor or synchronous generator they can absorb the reactive power they can also deliver the reactive power so therefore we can say that power exerted synchronous motor is going to operate in the lead it is going to operate in the leading power factor and the power exerted synchronous generator is going to operate in the lagging power factor and they both are going to deliver the reactive power whereas induction motor it is always going to absorb the reactive power so let me do a small correction here actually in the previous concept i would i've already told you here theta is called as the theta is the angle between the b and i a and psi is called as the angle between e f and i a I, 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 i have told that we are going to assign the power factor with respect to theta for the for generator and for phi for the motor so it's, it's, it's a wrong one see for either for synchronous motor or synchronous generator we are going to define the power factor with respect to theta itself so this is the wrong one always we have to be, we always we are going to define the power factor with respect to theta only whether it is a synchronous motor or whether it is a synchronous generator always we are going to define the power factor with respect to theta only this is a very important point whether it is a synchronous motor or whether it is a synchronous generator no matter whatever the motor or generator always we are going to define the power factor of the synchronous motor or synchronous generator with respect to theta only as we say in between the v and i a if i a leads we it is called as a leading power factor if i a lags we it is called lagging power factor if i a is in phase phase with respect to v it is called as a unity power factor as you can see clearly in this case also here at the over excitation see at the over excitation of synchronous motor you can see clearly as i have already told you we have defined the power factor with respect to theta theta is the angle between the v and i a so you can see clearly the current i a is leading the v so it is called as a leading power factor so synchronous motor is going to synchronous motor is going to act like a leading power factor at the over excitation because i a is leading the v we have defined the power factor with respect to theta which is angle between the v and i a either for synchronous motor or either for synchronous generator similarly at the under excitation of synchronous motor you can see clearly this is the phasor diagram that we are going to get so the current i a is lagging the v so current i a is lagging the v so, so therefore we can say this to be lagging power factor so therefore at the under excitation the current i a is lagging the v so it is called as the lagging power factor so this is the point that you always need to keep to remember how it is small mistake there but you have to always do remember we are going to define the power factor with respect to v and i a whether it is a synchronous motor or whether it is a synchronous generator always we are going to define the power factor with respect to v and i a only so here also we are going to define the for synchronous motor at normal excitation as i have already told you whether it is a synchronous motor or synchronous generator we are going to define the power factor only with respect to theta which is the phase angle between the v and i a so you can see clearly here the phase angle between the v and i a is again zero so power factor angle is equal to zero so so power factor is equal to unity so we can say it is said to be a unity power factor so a small correction that you always have to keep in mind whether it is a synchronous motor or whether it is a synchronous generator we are going to define the power factor with respect to theta only which is the phase angle between the v and i a 